much for coming. Thank you for staying late for this session. Um, my name is, is Niklas Gustafsson. I will talk a little bit about how Spotify works with operations. How we, the history for how we sort of evolved into the state where we are now and the way that we sort of approach this problem. Um, just to start out, as sort of a, a control question. Anyone who say Spotify user? All right. Uh, Awesome. Uh, anyone who's not at all familiar with Spotify or know what we're doing? Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, just very quickly, we're a music streaming service. Uh, we've grown pretty quickly. We, I think we just announced that we now have more than 100 million active users, which to me feels completely bonkers being at Spotify for five years. And I remember joining and we were a few million and I, we actually had this scalability design thinking around like what would happen if we scaled to 100 million users and it felt completely impossible but as it happens we now pass that point um so to understand how we ended up where we are when it comes to to operations uh, it's good to understand how we think around our engineering culture and our engineering our engineering practices uh, I'm going to go very briefly over this, but there are, if you're interested, there are a few videos that we published online. Uh, you can ex derive from the URI that they're actually two and a half years old, so that's a snapshot of how things work two and a half years old, but uh, two and a half years ago. But it still sort of describes the overall thinking that we still have. And one of the things that we've gone through is that we have grown as a company. So when I started, we were a little bit more than 100 people, and I, now we're somewhere north of 2,200. So that, that means a lot of changes to how we work, of course. Uh, we're also in a very competitive business. We have some pretty big, substantial competitors that also wants to do music streaming well, which means that we want to move very fast. We want to be able to release uh, new features very fast and be able to move quickly forward as a company. And our sort of main belief of the way that we can do this within our engineering organization or within our TPD, as we call it, tech product and design organization, is to build highly autonomous teams. And the primary, and this is true for all sort of levels and all ways of looking at the organization, but the, the primary team that we talk about is what we call a squad. And squad is just a stupid name for basically a scrum team or a agile team or whatever you want to call it. Uh, somewhere like seven to 12-ish developers or team members. Uh, and they're staffed to be fully staffed for their mission. They have, a, they have a mission. That mission might be build the best music search feature in the world or build, build the best music audio streaming functionality in the world, as, for example. Uh, and they're fully staffed to be able to deliver towards this mission. So they might have a bunch of mobile developers and a bunch of backend developers and some data engineer and a product owner and a designer, whatever makes sense for the mission they have. And again, they have, we're give, we give them a high degree of autonomy. The team will own their mission completely. And that also extends to the way they design their systems, for example, the way they, they approach solving a problem we leave to the team to decide. So there's very few, um, or no, architects or something like that that goes to the teams and tells them what, what to do. We give the teams the problem and it's up to them to solve, make sure, or figure out how to solve it. Uh, we do have some minimum set of, of principles around how we do this. Uh, and that's mainly to allow for moving things between teams, moving ownership of systems between teams and not ending up with a horrendously uh, mix of things. And when it comes to, to the backend um, services that we build, you could probably call them microservices. This is, of course, a very popular word now. Uh, we've built these small services for a very long time long before this particular term existed. So it still feels a little bit uncomfortable calling it the microservice architecture, but it probably is. We have hundreds of services and they're all fairly small and they, they do one thing and one thing well, and then we compose them into higher abstractions of functionality. 
And the thing with the, each of these services is that each of these services is owned by a squad. So that squad designs that service, uh, implements it, and deploys it in, in production. Which leads us then into the oper operational part of this. Uh, so, a brief history. Uh, this is a picture of, well, not actually this guy, but this is, this is the first operations team at Spotify. It was one guy, Emil. He's actually still around, surprisingly. Uh, he was head of operations, which meant that he basically were on call 24-7. Uh, he also did all the IT stuff for the company, so if you wanted a laptop, you went to Emil. If uh, Spotify was down, you went to Emil, and so on. Uh, for obvious reasons, this did not scale that well, so after a while there appeared a few other uh, typically like system administrator people around EML. Pretty, pretty strong system administrators. We were able to hire very good people into this role, but still a small, very small team. And the idea was that for each of the services we had, and this was early on, so we didn't have that many services, uh, for each of the services we had, we had a development owner and we had an operations owner. And these, were, these two were supposed to work very closely with, the get, which, with each other. So if, if I, as a uh, developer, development owner of a service, wanted additional hardware capacity, I asked my operations partner and he would make sure I had that. Or if, I, if, I, if we had an incident, we would sit in together, figure out what went wrong and try to fix it. And we did capacity planning together and so on. This worked pretty well for a while, but then we continued growing. And we weren't able to scale the amount of people in the operations team as quickly as we scaled engineers on the development side. So this is a picture of an operations owner with a bunch of developers around them asking for stuff all the time, which of course led to the operational part being a, a bottleneck for us. It was very hard scaling that organization. It was very hard hiring these people. And of course, over time, each of the engineers on the operational side had to take ownership for an ever greater number of services. And that was even worse when you were actually on call because the person who was on the call needed to understand a very large number of services. When we started out, it was maybe 10, 15 services, which was fine for someone on call to, to, to know and know what to, what to do when they explode in the middle of the night. After a while, there was 100 services, which made that much harder, of course. Which then implicitly meant that every developer was on call at all times. Because when something blew up, usually Friday evenings, because that's when we have peak traffic, uh, the person who's on call from the operations team would call a, the development owner for that service and ask them for help. I accidentally owned the the service with the highest requests rate at Spotify, which meant I spent every free Friday evening taking care of that service, falling over, which was not awesome. So we, at, after a while, we realized that this is not going to scale, and we wanted to grow the company even, even larger and even more aggressively. So we needed to do something, which is when we created what, uh, what we still call ops and squads. And this comes down to a very common theme when we have organizational scalability issues. So it's common that we start off with something as a centralized team, the operations team or an analytics team and so on. After a while we realize that this doesn't scale, this centralized thing is becoming uh, the bottleneck. So we very commonly choose to distribute this, to get this closer into the squads, into the delivery teams. And that was what we decided to do with um, with operations as well. Of course, this was not a, a simple process. It took quite a while to roll this out to all squads, but now every squad that has a service in production is also on call for that service. And this means that you run your own code, and this turns out to be a very, very good feedback loop. Uh, you want, basically you want it to hurt for yourself when your shit breaks in production, 
Uh, you don't want someone else to be up in the middle of the night. You want yourself to be the one who's, who's having, feeling the pain or the guy maybe that sits next to you. Of course, uh, things still break, so we needed a way to have a slightly more structured process around how we deal with incidents so they don't repeat themselves. So we created a, a incident process. Now, we're not a very process-heavy company. That's not the way we usually work. So when I say process, it's very, very lightweight, as you're going to see. And like I said, we still have incidents. So this was an incident back in March, which was partially my fault. Sorry about that. Uh, this was an incident the other week, which was partially my fault. Sorry about that. Uh, and the process looks like this. Something explodes. Uh, at that time, we basically, either the person on call or whoever is around, well, the person on call and uh, whoever is around, in addition, tries to help out to fix the immediate problem. Uh, that might be just rerouting traffic somewhere else or actually fixing it or rebooting some servers or whatever it needs to be, needs to be done, uh, increasing capacity perhaps. Once that's done and things get back to normal and we're back on office hours, we schedule a post-mortem meeting where we go through what actually happened and figure out how we can make sure that it never happens again. So for each of the incidents, we create a ticket in our ticketing system uh, and assign a bunch of remediations to this, to this ticket. And the idea with the remediations, again, is to make sure that this never happens again. And once the remediations are complete, and some of these remediations might be very, very short term, add this alert or add this documentation to our run books or whatever it might be. Some might be very long term, like redesign this system or redesign this infrastructure so that it's more resilient to failures. But once they're done, we're able to close this, um, this incident. And we have, at any given time, a large num amount of incidents going through this, this small uh, process. And a very, very important part of this is uh, the postmortems. And there's a, a concept for this called blameless postmortems. If you were at James' uh, talk this morning, I think he mentioned this. Uh, this was something that was uh, first described by, by Etsy, but it's in use in a bunch of, of companies nowadays. Uh, and I, I, I cannot understate how important this is to get, to get in place and get working in a good way. Basically, it comes down to when you sit in that meeting and discuss what went wrong during the incident, you never attribute blame to a specific person. Uh, instead, you only talk around what actually happened and how can we fix it. Again, James mentioned some case where someone actually required someone getting fired. This is the exact opposite of that. And the positive sort of loop that you get into is that once you have this in place and once people start feeling comfortable in these uh, discussions, you will have a much more honest discussion about what actually went wrong. There's no incentive to hide that I did a mistake or uh, someone else did a mistake. We can just talk around what actually happened, which means that we're much more open and honest and can figure out much more efficient remediations to make sure that this never happens again. Make sense? Of course, a problem that you get into when you have lots and lots of teams doing on-calls, instead of having this one team doing on-call and doing operations, you now have lots of team doing it. I think we are probably approaching 100 development teams pretty soon. Not all of them have stuff in, in production that needs on-call, but a fair amount of them do. So we have lots of on-call uh, schedules. And to make this efficient and also to sort of reuse what we learn as a company, we don't want each of these hundred or how many on-call schedules we have to make the same mistakes over and over again. We want to reuse learning stuff we have. So we need to find a good way to, to scale this. Uh, and we, we, again, I said before that we allow a high degree of autonomy, and that's also true for the way that, that Teams wants to work around how they take on-call. So the way that they set up their schedules or the way that they... Um, 
approach the actual, like, how do they document their run books and what, what not. That's very much left to the teams to decide what's optimal for them. And we have all types of combinations of on-call schedules. So some squads are sufficiently large that they can take on-call on their own. There are enough developers that can take on-call within a squad. Some squads have a much smaller number of developers and might actually need to pool up with other squads or, or whatever makes sense to them to create a sufficiently large on-call schedule. Again, we, we don't prescribe how this is done. But still, we want to be efficient in scaling this and, and again, reusing what we learn. And the simple answer to how we do that, if we, we try to automate everything that we do. Um, this is probably non-controversial, but there's very little that we do in, in production that is not fully automated. Um, and I'm going to give I, I'm going to get, try to give some examples of of how we do this. Uh, and one addition one additional um, major reason to why we do this is that we want to be able to scale our service super linear to the amount of people that we throw at managing that service. And to be able to do that, of course, we need a high degree of automation. So I'm going to give some examples of systems that we built. Because one of the nice things when you have an operations team and then all of a sudden you don't have an operations team that you ha still have a bunch of really strong infrastructure engineers. You can use them to build systems to scale your operations. So that that's what we did. So out of the operations team, we formed a bunch of pretty normal development focused squads, which instead of delivering features to end users, delivers features to other Spotify engineers. One of those systems is uh, something that we call system set. Uh, for someone who's around IBM mainframes and stuff, this name might ring familiar. Uh, this is our, basically our service registry. So this is where we uh, register all the services that we have in production. It will, oh yeah, that's not readable by anyone. Uh, it maintains a bunch of facts around the service and it enables us to uh, both know who's actually on call for a particular service at a particular time. So I can go into the system, into system said, look up a service, oh, it seems like our storage system is broken, let's go see who owns the storage system. There's a button over on the right side where you can actually raise an incident directly to that team if you want to. Uh, this also shows dependencies. So I can see if this particular service called Storage Assault goes down, I can see all the services that is dependent on that. So I will know the uh, sort of greater effect of my system being down. I can see what hardware nodes actually run this service or has instances of this service running. Um, I can actually go in here and do changes as well. So this is where I will change routing. So let's say that this service, for whatever reason, feels bad in our data center here in London. I can reroute that traffic to our data center in Stockholm while I figure out whatever is happening. So one, one uh, interesting thing with running a service registry is that no one gives a fuck. No one will register their services in this. Uh, well, some that are particularly Ambitious might, but when, once you have a thousand backend services, you will have a large number of them that are not in this system, which make this system less useful. So, and again, we have very few processes and very few rules and very few reviews that go through, so we can't really catch them that way. So the way that we need to deal with this is that we need to find an incentive for people to actually register their stuff in the system. And it's hidden down here. It says roll storage assault. This is actually the thing that you need to be able to get hardware at Spotify. So if you're not in the system, you're not getting any hardware. And which means you're not running in production, which means uh, we don't care about you anyhow. So, so this having this sort of loop makes it very useful. So we have a very, very high degree of our systems registered correctly in this in this um, in the system. So that role that I just mentioned, is, it's, it's used for the sort of the next step of this process, and that's getting hardware. And we announced a few months back that we're actually moving into Google Cloud, so hardware is sort of a, uh, not necessarily hardware anymore, but it's some sort of, of capacity, either actually on-prem hardware in our data centers or VMs in, 
GCP, doesn't matter. So we have a system called Cortana approval managers for this, which is uh, what you use to manage your capacity. And this is actually a screenshot from that system said uh, for, again, for the storage of whole service, where it completely are readable shows capacity in each of the data centers that we use. Uh, so what Cortana Pool Manager will do is that you, dec you declare your desired state for a service. I want seven servers in this data center and four servers in this data center. And Cortana will try to make sure that that desired state is always true, no matter what happens to broken hardware and whatnot. We wrote a pretty detailed blog post which goes through this, that if you're into hardware provisioning and stuff like that, is might be a good read. It shows the history of how we did this at Spotify, and it described what I described earlier on, like the first state being going to someone, them running a script a few weeks later maybe to get your hardware, where it, it actually, when I started, it could take like weeks to get hardware at Spotify because we were both pretty shitty at provisioning the hardware or actually buying the hardware, uh, or sorry, procure the hardware and to provision it. Provisioning it was a highly manual task. And now it takes me minutes to get uh, the service that I need or VMs that I need. And the last example that I want to mention is, called, is something that we call Helios, which is the tool that we use for uh, managing, deploying and managing Docker containers. So this is somewhat similar to Kubernetes, if you're familiar with that. Uh, we started out before Kubernetes existed, so that's why Helios exists. Uh, they're not a perfect one-to-one -one replacement, which is why we still maintain and use Helios, but it, over time it might be that we move into Kubernetes um, once all the needs that we have is, is fully supporting Kubernetes. Uh, this is something that we've open sourced, so it's on our GitHub page. And what it will do is that you basically, again, once you have your capacity up and running in Cortana, you declare on which servers you want your containers to, to run. Again, you usually use that role attributes to say that I want my this container to run on any server that has this particular role. And Helios will make sure that that um, container is running there. Uh, we actually have a, a fourth example which I might mention quickly, and that is that we also built a um, monitoring and learning system called uh, Heroic and Alien because we had pretty severe issues with scale and the existing monitoring solutions. That's also open source. So the Heroic part of that is also open source. It's also on, you know, on our GitHub page. Also one of these things that we were able to do once we have infrastructure engineers in, good, in a good shape. So did this actually help? And I guess since I'm here, that's a good sign that it did. Uh, so I, I'm going to go through three different ways in which this, this changed our life pretty dramatically. Again, we were able to scale. So we've gone from being a few tens of developers to now being hundreds of developers. And rather than being harder at doing things, once, once you get larger, it's now much easier to get stuff done. Uh, and we're at, I don't actually know the exact number, but something like 13, 14,000 servers, um, hardware servers at this point. And again, moving into GCP, so hopefully that's the peak that we'll see, but we'll see. Um, and we think this will continue to scale quite a bit further. So, like I said, we're currently at somewhere like 700 or so engineers. We think this will scale to quite a bit larger than that if we want to. Maybe we'll run into a point where it doesn't scale anymore because we have too many on-call schedules, too much uh, entropy in this sort of system, but we'll, we'll see when we get there. We've seen a significant decrease in the amount of incidents that we get. I did highlight a few earlier on, but the state that we were in previously where we had multiple major incidents per week because of the scale, there, that thing is now completely gone. This is one of the reasons we did other things to address that as well. I mentioned like redesigning a um, large part of our infrastructure. As part of that, we switched from Python, which we started out with, into to Java and running on the JVM, which was a huge improvement for us. Uh, 
and a bunch of other things in that area. But this is, I would argue that this is the biggest thing for us. And that, again, it's that feedback loop of you being hurt when your shit breaks that is incredibly powerful once you get that in place. And this, of course, also brings value to our users because our service is actually up and running more than it was before. And it also has increased our development speed. I mentioned this before, like now I can get a server in a few minutes rather than weeks. Or I can get a spin up a Cassandra cluster in an hour instead of days. Um, all because we invest in automation and invest in getting uh, operational duties to be much easier and less uh, burdensome to the developer. Uh, but just to set this into context, um, this is the way that we approach this problem. Uh, there are other very successful companies that has taken a completely different approach to this. Uh, Google is one interesting example. If you haven't read this book I was, and you're into operations, I would strongly recommend taking a look at it. It was published a few weeks or months by now, I guess, ago. Uh, and it's, it's a collection of exist or current and former service reliability engineers at, at Google that's written a book that basically a collection of small stories around how they run their operations, which again, this is a very different way than we do it. They've sort of kept opera centralized operations teams around in a very different way from what we did initially, but still having that uh, centralized team. And then they set up other um, mechanics to get that feedback loop into place. Uh, super interesting. Again, I strongly recommend you reading it. Uh, that was all. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any, or thoughts, or comments. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. I, the question was, are we using private or public cloud? Is that correct? Yeah, so we're using Google Cloud, which is a public cloud. So right now, we're actually in this weird state of having a hybrid setup where we have still have most of our capacity on in our on-prem data centers, but we're moving over to GCP. So once we're done, it's going to be the great majority in GCP. So the question was, what do we use for centralized logging? Um, I think the question is probably that we don't. Um, we do ship logs into our Hadoop and now BigQuery infrastructure. So that we can use to correlate things. Uh, that's not real time by any means though. So it's, it doesn't really help in operational situations. Uh, we have we do use uh, Elk pretty heavily, but it's not used as a centralized place. It's used for each team to collect their logs if if, if they need to. Um, I would say that the majority of the teams probably don't use that, but quite a few do. Uh, so we don't have one place where all logs is available in a uh, to be able to, for correlation, which might be nice. We do we have played around with doing that, but it gets pretty hard at scale. Um, so so far we haven't figured out a good way of doing it. So the question was, uh, how do we uh, convince developers to go on on-call? Is that correct? Yeah. So this is a very, very interesting question. It's, it's certainly not um, without complications. So what we try to do is to basically inspire a culture where we care very heavily around uh, the availability of our, of, our, of our service. And there's a certain amount of pride, if you like, to make sure that your stuff is, is up and running. And that is help pretty significantly with that. So we, we, we do have these discussions every now and then, but they're fairly rare, I would say. Uh, we are not forcing anyone to go on call. It's, it's, uh, it's opt-in to go on call. But you, if you go to a team, you will find that the great majority of engineers do take on call. So it's, but it's more of a sort of cultural approach to it than anything else. 
Uh, yeah, so that's a good, yeah, so you do get, you do get a financial, uh, you do get paid for being on call, you do get extra paid for being on call. It's not a, it's not a huge amount of money, so I, I have a hard time seeing that most engineers do it because of getting rich. Um, it's more that you, you should get a, a reasonable uh, pay for the, for the work that you do, of course. We do the way that we do payments is that we pay you for every day that you're on call, uh, not when you actually have incidents, because again that sets up this weird feedback loop of breaking things to make money. Uh, <laughs> that being said, if we have if we have uh, horrendously long incidents, which is pretty rare, but it happens every now and then, we will figure out some extra compensation for those engineers that are involved. Uh, that's very rare, though, that we have those extended ones. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. So the question was, how do we um, manage ownership for legacy services or old stable services? And the question is, or the answer is in the exact same way as any other service. But it, it, you, 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 you make a very good point in that some services will see a much higher rate or interest in development, uh, and some will just be chugging along in production, uh, which is a problem in that developers will tend to know the stuff that they work on frequently very well, especially once you get new developers, compared to that old stuff that I've never touched. Uh, so the way that we try to approach this is to be pretty... Um, careful in writing runbooks for everything, so you shouldn't need to know the service uh, in any detail to be able to take on call for it. You should have good instructions for what could possibly happen to the service. Again, through this incident process, we try to make sure that the same incident doesn't repeat over and over again, but a service has a particular set of characteristics that makes, makes, that makes some types of incident more likely. Like if you have a big Cassandra cluster, that usually comes with some incident that usually can happen. Uh, and that means that it should be very similar for me to run a, or operate a service that I know very well and one that I don't know. So the on-call schedule that I go on for, as an example, we have an uh, unusually large amount of services in that on-call schedule. Um, so that means that I actually don't know all of those services, and there are services in squads where I've never worked. So I really need these runbooks to be able to operate those services and know what, what I would do with them in the middle of the night. Um, so that we try to approach them that way. So the question was, when we switched to, to operations in squads, did we add operations people to the squads? Uh, and the general, question, general answer to that is no, we didn't. Uh, instead, the engineers that already existed in the squads took on on call. There, are, there were examples of squads where they did not have engineers with sufficient um, experience in doing that, so they would, act, they would actually hire once, once they hired anyhow, they would look for someone with more operational experience, but we didn't do it as a large-scale thing. It was more of a, uh, a training exercise, if you like, where, where needed. But again, much comes down to having good tooling, uh, so that helps very much for us. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's a very, so the question was, do the teams need to use the same technology stack? So that's that stack, uh, and that's a very interesting question. So the answer is yes and no. So we have this very minimum set of, of principles around how we do stuff, stuff. Like I said, we build stuff on Java. If you're in the user request path, you should definitely write your services in Java. Uh, we deploy to Linux servers. We deploy to Docker containers. And that's roughly about it. Uh, on top of that, what we try to work with again is to set up good incentives for team to make, teams to make sane choices. So a, a maybe interesting example is like if I need to uh, 
persistently store some data in my service. I could, I could use something available on the internet, uh, but if I do, I would need to take on full responsibility to make sure that the, that works within my squad. I would need to figure out the backup strategy, uh, how to do restore testing, how to scale that, whatever it might be. But we also have infrastructure teams that offers, internally offers support around some technologies that we have found to work well for us. So we have one such, teams, one such team that offers very good support for Cassandra, as I mentioned before. Which means that there's an incentive for teams to choose Cassandra when they need to persist something, and we have a lot of experience around how to run Cassandra. Maybe too much incentive, so we will actually use Cassandra for things that isn't necessarily the best fit for Cassandra, but it's still easier for teams to, to run that. So that's we try to work with those incentives rather than forcing solutions onto people. And this, this is also true, so if we build some internal tool, like the Helios thing that I mentioned for Docker deployment, for example, when we built that, and, and still to this day, there's no policy forcing you to use Helios. If there's a better way for your team to deploy your stuff, do use that. Uh, turns out that it's vastly beneficial to most teams to use what is best supported. So you will see that the great majority of teams runs on Helios. Uh, but there is sort of a free market, if you like, around this, that we don't force tooling on, on the teams. And the good thing with that is that we're also, that means that our infrastructure teams are pretty much forced to write pretty good, good tooling, otherwise no one will actually use it. Uh, so, so I, I understood the first question around continuous deployment. What was the second question? Uh, how many times are you updating the system? Ah, so yeah. So the question was, do we use continuous deployment and how often do we deploy, basically, or update the system? Uh, so yeah, uh, again, it's very much up to each team how they want to do, but I would say that most teams by now use continuous deployment. Um, and we are heavy users of Canary service. We don't actually have really a functioning or, and I don't want to have a functioning staging environment for most things, but we rather deploy things straight into production, which sounds scary, uh, but actually works really well. Do remember that we're a music streaming service. We don't build nuclear plants or pacemakers or whatever. I actually worked in the pacemaking industry, and um, yeah, that's a different story. I don't want the pacemaker. Uh, so, so we, yeah, so we, what we do is that we deploy, in most cases we deploy into one canary host to make sure that things work as we expect them. And then, one, and we, of course, we run a shitload of automated tests before we do that. And then once things seem stable, when it comes to like performance and whatnot, we will promote that build and roll it out everywhere. And we might actually have tiered, the further tiered deployment strategies, like deploy into one, uh, one data center or one node in each data center, whatever makes sense for that particular service. But again, we leave that up to the teams to decide how often they deploy. Uh, the question on how often we actually deploy is very often, like we will deploy hundreds of times per day, I would say. Uh, but again, it's up to each team to deploy. There's no centralized coordination, so I actually have no idea how many times we deploy per day. Um, but yeah, pretty frequently. So then one question that usually pops up is how we do like system testing for that. And like how do we actually make sure that things actually work and formally verify that. Uh, and what we do that is the, that we've found so far found most effective is that we run um, UX driven automated tests through our clients. So we will have test suites running our clients, doing a bunch of activities that users will do against the production backend and then use that as the sort of verification that our backend actually works. Uh, of course, part of the automation testing that happens before deployment contains a bunch of unit and integration tests, but that doesn't test the, the full backend, right? And once you have hundreds of services, it's pretty hard to test the entire backend in a good way. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah. So the question was, do we have few QA people because it's automatic? On the back end, yes. 
Uh, we have very few QAs that, or perhaps, I, yeah, probably not none, but very, very few. Uh, on the client side though, so what I've described today is how our backend works, where we have this highly like microservice, highly modulized backend. Once you get into the client world, you need to ship one client to users. You can't ship 800 clients and ask users to do that coordination. Uh, unfortunately, that would have been nice. So we have one client, which means that we, again, we need to have all the coordination stuff, and there we'll have a bunch of QAs that do regression testing on our clients and exploratory testing. Uh, we do automate a fair amount of that as well, but it's not 100% automated. Yeah? Yes? How do we handle the security between services? Is that the question? Uh, so, yeah, I won't go into too much details on security for maybe obvious reasons, but uh, we have pretty heavy security when it comes to, or we focus heavily on the security when it comes to our perimeter, so in between internet and our backend. Um, and we run a, run a bunch of services in that layer that are basically just a bunch of uh, auth auth authentication and uh, audit logging type of services. Uh, for, for the backend, we, yeah, again, without going into too much detail, but each mes message that we send around in the backend will contain a bunch of authenticated facts around that request, like who issued this request and, and so on that the backend then can use for authentication purposes, um, or each service can use for authentication purposes. Um, then there's a bunch of details on top of that, like se having secure uh, transport protocols and whatnot in between. And yeah, and that's also actually an interesting question, uh, inter different interesting point. So the security is the one area where we do have a formal process around reviews where we do have a centralized team and so on. So that's an area that keeps sticking out as a as an, uh, very different approach compared to everything else. And we'll see how we scale that going further, but that's the current thing here on our security efforts. But we do have a pretty, pretty good security team which will make sure that we're building stuff in a good way. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'll be around if you have any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.